<laughs> what is Sanatan Dharma? Let's understand these two words. Sanatana means eternal. Dharma means not as it is being interpreted today. Dharma means the law, that which rules. Sanatana Dharma literally means that that framework of principles or laws which rule life eternally. There are certain things which are seasonal. <laughs> there are certain things which are generational. There are certain things which belong to different eras. But there is certain aspect of life which is for always. Certain framework, certain laws which are for always. So today, maybe <laughs> particularly in the political atmosphere, it is being seen as a certain identity. Sanatana means eternal. How can something be eternal unless it's all-inclusive? If something has to be eternal, it has to be all-inclusive. There is simply no other way. This and that cannot be eternal. Only that which embraces everything can be eternal. Many aspects of our life are transitional, but there are some aspects of our life which are eternal. If you recognize and realize the eternal laws or the sanatana dharma of your life, I want you to understand this not as a cultural identity, but as a fundamental to our existence. Those laws, the framework which governs the fundamentals of our existence. This is Sanatan Dharma, a culture which invested heavily in this direction, a culture which made ultimate freedom or liberation or mukti or moksha or nirvana and many other names which made that the main principle of life got identified as sanadana dharma that means our fundamental goal is ultimate on the side we do many things people have businesses people have families people have careers people have this and that pleasures fads and compulsions all this is side business this culture invested itself in such a way the main fundamental focus of this life is ultimate liberation or mok so this culture got the identity of Sanatana Dharma because there are many longings within a human being. <laughs> when you're a little child, lollipop is the highest longing. As you grow up, it changes. When you are 12, 15, one thing, 18, 20, another thing, 30, 35, another thing. But if you examine your life carefully, if you look at the nature of your desiring very carefully, you will see the longing is to expand. Whatever you have, whatever you may be in your life, you still want to be something more. If that's something more, more happens, you want to be something more. If that happens, you want to be something more. If you really look at it, you want to become limitless. This is the longing that the very nature of how human being is made is such that something within us does not like boundaries. Something within us wants to become boundless. If it finds an unconscious expression, if it finds a very physical expression, we call this sexuality. If it finds a mental expression, it gets labeled as ambition, desire, conquest, or maybe simply shopping. If it finds an emotional expression, we call this love. All these are longings to be something more than what you are right now. If it finds a conscious expression, we call this yoga. So in one way, I know some won't like it, but I'm not standing for Alex. So, <laughs> so in some ways, what you are recognizing as Sanatana Dharma, as a culture, is a mass application of yogic sciences. When you want to apply a profound sign to a whole population, it needs to go through a certain amount of transformation. So that transformation today generally getting identified as Sanatana Dharma, but the most important aspect is that Sanatana Dharma means you are not caught up with the immediate needs of the day. Your focus is always pitched towards the ultimate goal of life. Day-to-day -day things you'll handle it to the best of your ability, but that does not determine the quality of your life. The longing that you have to become free, the longing to become one with everything. When you say free, you want to become free from your individual nature. In a way, you want to become free from your own existence so that you become one with everything. That's why I said nothing can be eternal unless it's all-inclusive. Sanatana Dharma, the only way forward, if you ask. Not as a religion, not as an individual culture, not your culture versus my culture. But at some point, if human beings don't look beyond their individual and immediate needs and look for the ultimate well-being, of who they are and what everything else is around us. Well, there will be no solution, but today the world is moving in this direction. They may not be calling it Sanatana Dharma, but in many ways the world is moving in this direction. How is it moving? See, one thing that's happening is nearly 42% of European population these days are saying they have no religion. 32 to 33% of the US population is saying they have no religion. A similar percentage in UK is saying they have no religion. Actually, it is 36 to 37% in UK. So, except in the developed part of the 
the world, largely people are saying no religion. What this means is the structures that were built up there in the sky, or to put it simply, the, the heavens are collapsing in people's mind. Nobody want to go to heaven anymore. I have seen this in the last 40 years. This year is going to be 40 years since I started teaching. So in these 40 years, what I have seen is about 20 years ago, at least in the Western societies, if you asked a group of people, how many of you want to go to heaven? 80% of the hands would go up. Today, if you go and ask a group of people, let's say a thousand people are there, you ask them, how many of you want to go to heaven? Very hesitantly, very shy and embarrassed, two, three hands will go up. Rest of them say, no, the young people don't want to go to heaven because whatever the old marketing machine, which has been telling you what is there in heaven is not attractive to them. They're asking, is there free Wi-Fi? Hello, you want free Wi-Fi in heaven? So because of this in people's minds, heavens are collapsing. When heavens collapse, what will fill the gap? The immediate gap will be filled by alcohol, drugs, drugs and other things because people are trying to make something out of their life. But they will tire of that. The more intelligent will look beyond that. Those who indulge also will get tired of it after some time, but it'll take its toll, unfortunately. Then what is it? Then people will look for the signs of well-being. That is what he stands for. This is why I said, Adi Yogi is not of the past, but a phenomenon of the future. Though it was well over 15,000 years ago, what he offered is a scientific technological solution for the subjectivity of the human being. Not philosophy, not ideology, not belief system, not tickets to heaven, but the signs of subjective well-being of the human being. Though millenniums, so many millenniums have passed, never before human societies were really ready to address their subjectivity scientifically. Only now, this generation and the coming generation are for the first time beginning to think logically. This is the first time that such a large mass of people beginning to think logically. We may think they're thinking wrong, it doesn't matter, but at least they're thinking for themselves. Otherwise, in the previous generations, they were not allowed to think, especially ladies. You must appreciate the times because just 100 to 100 years ago, you were not supposed to think at all. If you did think for yourself, you would get punishment for that. In this culture, it was not so much so, but in the rest of the world, it was very much so. Women were not supposed to think for themselves. So women are beginning to think for themselves. What it means is straight away, 50% of the world's population has come into thinking process. So that's not a small thing. And now that people are thinking for themselves, once you think however crazy you think somebody is thinking, there is a logical process to their thought process. So now seeking solution, even subjective solutions in a more logically correct way or a scientific manner will naturally come forth. When this happens, Adi Yogi becomes super significant because he's already ready with his tools, 112 ways. So this is Sanatan Dharm as a sign. As a culture, it functions differently. We don't have to impose our culture on anybody, but science is not an impos imposition. Science is a solution. So in many ways, the future of the world is in Sanatan Dharm, but don't try to rub it on them, saying that you must take up my culture not necessary. The important thing is they look for ultimate well-being, not for immediate well-being. That is Sanatan Dhar. Satpiro, you say that you are always stoned. What is that? I'm sorry? But you look more stoned than usual on Mahashivaratri. <laughs> What's happening with you, Satguru? asks <laughs> Iliad from Lebanon. It is Lebanese people. It's not legal in Lebanon, that's why. Not yet. I heard everybody's falling asleep, so I'm coming there for you. Some Lebanese lady is accusing me that I'm more st stoned than usual. I want to show you I'm doing fine, huh? <laughs> uh, am I? Haven't I? Haven't I awake enough, alert enough? See, they're from Lebanon. Somebody's saying I'm more stoned than usual. <laughs> well, see, when we were designing Adiyogi's face, it took me over two and a half years to get it right. What, did, what is it that was so complex about it? We wanted to get stillness, exuberance, and intoxication in one face. Do you think you're somewhere close there? So why is intoxication important? Because if you are not intoxicated, you will die of stress. Yes, that's what I was telling you. 
There is scientific research to show that the cannabinoids or endocannabinoids produced in the body are up 70%. For somebody who has just started Shambhavi Mahamudra, don't ask me what is my percent. 70% high mean, as I said earlier, it is much higher than what happens even in a sexual intercourse. It's much higher than that. Just sitting here, you blissed out. This is how you become free, not by denial that you become free. You become free because just sitting here is just so fantastic. Just being alive and breathing is so absolutely blissful. You don't have to do anything else, you just find. So what is special about this day? As we have told you a thousand times, there is a natural upsurge. When there's a natural upsurge, cycle is broken, there shall be no life. Let me tell you a little story. Can I tell you a story? I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm asking, I'm asking your permission because for most people, if I say once upon a time, they think it's bedtime. This happened not so long ago. Uh, a rich man, a rich family built a nice new house. It is part of the culture here that when you build a new house, generally in the rest of the world, they will party They'll get drunk and get sick on the second day of going into their new house. But here, they will invite a sage, a seer, or a yogi to come and bless their house. So they invited a yogi. He arrived. He's a yogi. But they welcomed him like a king. They did all the best things that they can do to a guest, fed him well. Then time to leave is coming. So the Kirshik from Devi Hanimas Safaru, Himalayas, and Kashi are more closely associated with ship ship instead of those places. Why do you choose southern India to establish Adi Yogi and celebrate a ship? <laughs> and not everything you choose, some things choose you. Hello, both of you. <laughs> this, this, this Lebanese lady has a lot of questions, let me answer them. So, <laughs> why? Wellangiri Hills, not my choice. Probably I've said this many times, but you know, she's, left. she's not heard me. Well, right from my infancy, I always had a mountain peak in my eyes, in the background of my vision. Always a mountain. This will be, this will sound crazy because till I became 16 years of age, I thought there are mountain peaks in everybody's eyes because it was always there. When I'm awake and asleep, it was always there. When I was around 16, you know, that's when you really start talking. Then I realized nobody has mountains in their eyes, just me. So I started trekking. I trekked Western Ghat almost every peak in these 1700 kilometers from Karwa to Kanyakumari. I did 11 times and climbed every peak. Then I realized I'm not finding it, it's somewhere else. Then thinking it could be because everybody in India was talking about Himalayas. So when I was 19, for the first time, I went to Himalayas. The moment I saw this peak, I know it's not there because they're very different in their structure. But from the age of 19, 27 years, every year I trekked in Himalaya. So you're asking why am I not feeling cold? That's why. <laughs> because I'm internally air conditioned, both cold, hot. So I, we went on looking for the mountain. After some time, it's almost like I'm not going to find it. In 1987, for the first time, I landed in Coimbatore and I just got off a night bus at around 3.45 in the morning and it just blew me away. I just sat in a place and lost myself for almost an hour and a half. Then I knew it's somewhere here. We started looking. I found it in 1993. I saw the peak probably you have not seen from here. If you, you know, go a couple of kilometers this way or this way, you will see the seventh hill. Once I saw that peak, the peak in my eyes disappeared. And I knew this is a place. At that time, there were no road, simply not approachable. We just an open piece of land. I just said, this is the place. We didn't know who owned it. We did not know it's available or not. But on the 11th day, after I stepped in all this land, we had registered the land in the name of the foundation. And since then, there's been no looking back. So... I'm not all choice. I'm a slave. Blissful, that's all, but slave. Not everything is my choice. Not everything is nobody's choice. Bob Rao from the U.S. asks, Shiva has so many conflicting qualities. He's the greatest dancer, but also sits absolutely still. He's the ultimate ascetic, but he's also married. What Sadhguru 
is the true quality of ship. <laughs> well, this is a, a very disturbing issue of modern time that everybody has to be something. You can't just be just like that. You got to be something. Everybody wants to nail you with one quality, but that's not the nature of a human being. One moment you're wonderful, another moment you're nasty. Hello? You do that, don't you? Another moment you're blissful, another moment you're a little pensive, so many things. A human being can be so many things, but we are always trying to nail one quality on somebody. Somebody's a good guy, somebody's a bad guy. I have never seen a good guy or a bad guy in my life. Everybody is capable of everything. Hello? But whole cultures are going about saying, these are bad guys, these are good guys. I said, you're bad guys, you okay? There is no such thing. This is the beauty of being human and this is the danger of being human. That you're walking one step out, you fall on your face, right step, everything is fine. This is so around you and also within you, every moment. This is why consciousness to Shiva or you call someone Shiva because he has tasted his nothingness. He is not just tasted his good and bad. He is tasted his nothingness. You definitely cannot call nothingness good or bad. Well, some people will name that also, nothing is bad. I want to be something. Well, if you are something, you become a quantity. If you become nothing, you become universal and eternal. Nothing means you must understand this by putting a hyphen between no and thing. You are not a thing. Are you a thing? You're not a thing. If you're just identified with your bones and flesh, you're a thing. But little more fire of life is happening within you. We can't call you a thing anymore. Hello? We can't call you a thing anymore because this is life. So Shiva is exuberant life. You cannot contain it to any particular value, to any particular quality, to <laughs> this little. <laughs> you cannot contain him to this or that. He's capable of being everything. Well, even you are, but you nail your things on one thing or the other. It, it's time to unhinge yourself. This doesn't mean you'll go wild. No. If your humanity is absent or, I don't know, you put it in a trash can, then you'll have to carry the burden of morality on your head. If your humanity is overflowing, you don't need the burden of morality on your head. That is the story of Shiva. He's clearly telling you, he is a living human being. He is not made of a bunch of morals and values and ethics. His humanity is overflowing. Sadhguru, we have time for two more questions. Pooja from South Africa asks, Why do we worship Shiv when he was surrounded by distorted and demented beings, Ganas and Rakshas? Like this. See, uh, this is a very serious and painful problem that human societies have ca carried for generations, for centuries and millennia. If somebody doesn't look like you, you think something terrible should be done with them. Hello? They just don't look like you. They can be just a different gender, they can be a different race, they can be different something, just different. Because somebody is different, you think they're not all right. How many terrible things have we done simply because somebody looks a little different from us? How many terrible things? So once again, the same question. He's got Ghana, distorted beings. See, today the young people, see that hairstyle looks distorted to me. See, this guy shaved off a little bit and left a little bit of hair. Looks distorted to me. You can make anything distorted. It doesn't agree with you. It becomes distorted. There is nothing distorted. Why should all of us look the same way? Is there such a rule? Yes, unfortunately. Unfortunately, everybody should look the same. Because the whole thing is called industrialization. All of us should look like the same product. Because there is an industry called education. There is an industry called economy. There's so many industries. If you become a nut which doesn't fit into anything, what do we do with you? We want to see that we can make use of you. If we can't use you, what good are you? Well, somebody is looking totally different from us. Why should we call them distorted? Maybe we are distorted. Hello? Maybe we are distorted. There is no such thing as distortion. This universe allows every shape, every form, every color, Every creed, this allows everything. There is no such thing as distortion in this universe. Tell me, is planet Earth distorted? Suppose you look like planet Earth, are you distorted? I leave that to you. So, your ideas of distortion are rooted in your prejudice as to who is distorted. How do you know you are not distorted? Shiva himself was considered distorted when 
to test his head. Right. There is, there is technological problems as to how far I can go. So when, like, uh, you know, today is Mahashivratri, the ascetic, see that this is the day when he became Achaleshwara. That means he became absolutely still, like a mountain he became. The householders, family people believe this is the day he got married. This is his wedding anniversary. Let me tell you something about his wedding. When Sati... <laughs> When, <laughs> when his wedding was fixed with Sati, who was uh, the daughter of a king, the father completely disowned the girl because she wants to marry this absolutely crazy looking man with dreadlock, ash smeared from head to toe, wear elephant skin around his waist, that too freshly skinned, still dripping blood. That's his clothing, that's his dress. So uh, the father said, no way, you marry this man, finished? No, no, absolute no. And somehow she convinces the mother and the mother seeing the girl is absolutely in love, she is to this and somehow the wedding is fixed. Then everybody who is somebody, <laughs> all of them arriving the local small kingdoms, princes, princesses, everybody in their best attire, all coming for the wedding. And Sati is all fully dressed up, everybody is ready. Then Adiyogi Shiva comes with full dreadlock, ash smeared, blood dripping from his elephant skin. And all these, his friends, who are all, they even have limbs. They have limbs which have no bones. So you know what all they can do. Even though you got bones, see what all you do. If you had no bones, how many things you would do? They were doing all that. People just saw, oh, what is this? And when he arrived, Sati's mother, Meena, saw him, thought that my girl is going to go with this man. She just fainted. Then Sati knew this is going to be a disastrous marriage now. So she went to him and said, please take on a more socially accepted form. He said, what? What? what is wrong with me? A little, not drunk from outside, drunk from inside. Then she said, please, my mother has fainted. She will lose her life if she once again sees you like this. Then I said, okay, your mother, all right. And he transformed himself into a resplendent being. In that form, he was called a Sundaramurti. That means the most beautiful man. So then the wedding happened. Then the father also could not believe, wow, Oh, this is the man, the same guy. This has happened sometimes. Hello. <laughs> so this aspect of what is distortion is all in our mind. If we learn to simply look at things without our own judgments about everything, everything has its place. Hello. A worm, an insect, a bird, a creature, everybody has their place, isn't it? Not just us. And that too among us, they must look like us. If everybody just looked like you, could you live in this world? Hello. Nobody looks like you. That is the blessing we have. If everybody looked like you, finished your... Don't, no, never ask for this. And also, what is it? The problems that you have with people around you. They are not like you. That's a problem. Yes, you can't get along with somebody. Why? Because they're not like you. Not just physically, in every other way. Yes, I want you to imagine. Just one more person, just like you in your house. Can you live there? One is too much. So we are glad nobody is like us. Hello? We are really glad nobody is like us. If there was one more like us, we will have to exit. 